Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel Noah. I'm a senior here today at Elgin High and we are very excited to introduce you guys and get started on the very first day of the National Biodiversity Teaching. Today's theme is ocean mammals and marine life and we'll be hearing from Dr. Giles on southern resident killer whales, past, present, future conservation and recovery. And let's give a very warm welcome to Dr. Giles. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for that nice introduction. Um, it's quite early for me here uh, in California at 6 a.m. Uh, so let's see how this goes. Um, I'm, uh, as I was introduced, I'm uh, Dr. Giles, Deborah Giles. I go by my last name. Um, I am the research director at the Center for Well Research on San Juan Island. And the primary subject of our study is the southern resident killer whales. And uh, my boss, Kim Balcom, and his team of people over the years have been studying these animals for four decades, uh, a little bit more than four decades. And so there's a tremendous amount of information that comes out of the center that um, has gone into helping to uh, set up some of the recovery uh, goal of some of the recovery uh, strategies for these whales and just keeping the general public and the um, federal government up to date on the most recent information statistics about these animals. Um, we also are involved in a number of other research projects, which I'll talk a little bit about as the um, slideshow goes on. So this is a nice picture here of um, uh, uh, J27, and this was a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a, a breach that he's doing in front of the research vessel that I was on. Um, he's a magnificent animal, and uh, he's still with us, so I'm, uh, I'm glad to, to know that he's one of my favorites. We're not supposed to have favorites, but we all do. So um, <clears throat> let's get going. I think there might be some sort of delay, so I pushed the forward button. But I'm not seeing my slide two. Are you guys seeing slide two? Hmm. Okay. That's too bad. Uh, we tested this. Okay, there we go. Maybe it's just, oh, now it's just flying through. Um, so uh, the population of animals uh, uh, that were, became, that became known as the resident um, whales, they became known as residents because they were fairly predictable uh, to uh, say come May of every year, these whales would come into the inland waters from the Pacific and uh, they could be uh, seen on a lot of days um, and some months like July, most days. And so people became um, very accustomed to seeing the whales say May through October. And this was great to be able to see them, to whale watch, but it was bad for them because ultimately uh, it became very predictable on where to go to take whales, to find whales, and then take whales out of the population for amusement parks. So um, as the slide says, live captures were very active in the area from 1962 to 1976. And thankfully, um, by 1976 in the area, uh, the, there was enough public outcry and federal concern on both sides of the border that the captures in the inland waters, what's now become known as the Salish Sea, um, which in, includes uh, San Juan Islands in Washington State and then the Canadian Gulf Islands in BC, Canada, just above us, um, captures ended uh, essentially in 1976. Um, but by that time, as many as 68 animals, animals had been taken out of the population um, uh, about 11 of those were killed in the process. Um, there's fairly um, amazing uh, footage, sad footage, and uh, a good accounting of this in the movie Blackfish, if you're interested in it, uh, more about the capture era. Um, anyway, suffice it to say that um, the, the, the captures ended, but part of the, the reason that those captures ended was the work of uh, Mike Big in Canada. So it was Mike's... Um, claim, and he was right, that he could tell the difference between individual whales. And when I talked to Ken Balcom, the director of the Center for Whale Research, 
um, he tells us that uh, Mike was ridiculed uh, somewhat within the whale community because people didn't believe that he could tell the difference between one whale to the next, but he he uh, kept uh, kept up with his claim, he kept up with his science, and uh, over a couple of years he was able to show that yes, indeed, they did, uh, they were, you know, humans were able to tell them apart. Whales are um, very identifiable by uh, the saddle patch behind their dorsal fin and also the shape and um, <clears throat> shape of the dorsal fin and nicks and scratches that they acquire. Those uh, stay fairly constant over time. Scratches might change a little bit, but those other things um, essentially are like our fingerprints. Both left and right sides of the whales are different. And so Mike, Mike Big was um, absolutely right in the claim that he could tell the difference between the whales. And so um, in the, uh, on the Canadian side, uh, whoops, uh, on the Canadian side, uh, Mike Big got to work uh, in the uh, early 70s, and by 1976, Ken Balcom in the U.S. was hired by our federal government in, in uh, the United States to get an idea of how many whales were left after the captures. And uh, I'll get to the statistics about that in just a little bit. But um, this is a slide here that shows some of the things that scientists, early scientists, started noticing about the whales. And uh, in our region, it was uh, determined. So in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Mike and Mike Big and Ken Balcom and colleagues um, were able to identify three distinct ecotypes. Um, and what I mean by ecotypes are essentially they're, um, we now know from genetics that they should be considered different, at least subspecies, if not separate species altogether. Um, but these early studies, which are pretty amazing when you think back about what they were piecing together based on observations and photographs, um, and then now they've, they've been, that information has been shown to be true, that these whales are distinctly different. They eat different, um, eat at different levels of the food chain. They, um, their social groupings or life histories are completely different. Genetics are completely different. Uh, there's some amazing uh, DNA study that, studies that have come out showing that these whales are um, very, very vastly different. For example, the mammal eaters that occur in the same waters as the fish eaters um, have um, are potentially. Um, so far removed from each other that they haven't had a common mating for 700,000 years, um, somewhere between 300 and 700,000 years, which is phenomenal. Um, and then, uh, so even, even morphologically or physically, they look different. The more you study them, the more you can really tell the difference. The shape of the dorsal fin is different right here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but um, the shape of the dorsal fin is different. Saddle patches tend to be different. Eye patch shapes are different. And just the basic overall morphology of the, of the animal is different. Um, the mammal eaters have a ro more robust uh, jaw, and uh, that makes sense considering some of the ramming that they have to do um, to kill their prey. Um, and uh, things like shark eaters have teeth that get ground down like um, as if they're uh, being ground down by uh, sandpaper, which in a way they kind of are because shark skin is very rough. So um, I'm always amazed when I think back about the early scientists that were looking at these killer whales and how much they were actually able to show that has then now been proven through um, kind of um, more, um, for example, mitochondrial DNA has shown these whales to be different, and the early scientists were able to tell that just by observations. So uh, it's a neat thing to get into animal behavior if anybody's interested in that. So uh, around the world, uh, this just kind of shows some of the pictures of uh, what I was describing. Partial beaching in Argentina, it's a pretty dangerous hunting strategy, but these, this particular group of whales um, have really mastered it. Although, as I understand, sometimes uh, young eager males do get stuck up on the beach, and it's not uncommon for mom to go up on the beach and kind of help him get off the beach, which is um, shows how how socially bonded these animals are. Um, we've got shark eaters and ray eaters, and then mammal eaters. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, our mammal eaters have a wide variety of things to eat and their populations are increasing, whereas our southern resident fish-eating killer whales, um, their menu is very slim. They're very picky eaters. They preferentially eat Chinook salmon, which is um, those numbers of, of wild Chinook are 
decimated in uh, throughout the entire range from Monterey, California to the Pacific Northwest. I'll talk a bit more about that as the slideshow goes on. But just some nice pictures here showing the difference in killer whales and um, you can maybe start to see the difference between their body shape and their eye patch shape and things like that. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll try and pay attention to the screen too. Uh, you can pop in with questions and I'll try and get to them um, either during that slide or uh, I'll get back to them. So these are some fun pictures of, uh, of uh, the early scientists in the um, in the, this is a picture of Ken from uh, the early days of the study of Orca Survey. He's in the top there with the video camera. And then below is uh, Mike Big in the green sweatshirt. Um, unfortunately, he passed away far too young uh, in 1990. And then his uh, folks that took over his work after him, John Ford in the middle and Graham Ellis on the end on the left. And uh, this, these uh, photos of whales uh, just coming down the right-hand side really are a great uh, um, way to see what Mike Big was seeing early on, how the whales really don't change, their saddle patches don't change over time. And things like Nick's um, might change a little bit, like that top, right, uh, top left-hand corner of J2, and that early photo from 1976, you can see when her Nick, which became her um, one of her classic identifying marks, a half moon, uh, I mean a, ha a crescent shaped Nick out of her tra the trailing edge of her dorsal fin. In that early photo, you can see how it was a tear in her dorsal fin, and then over time that flap fell off, and then um, the wound healed and became her classic um, crescent shape uh, mark that that people would look for to see whether or not they were looking at J2. And then K-12 and L-25. Uh, L-25, interestingly, a little side note, is uh, Lolita, the killer whale that's in, um, unfortunately, she's still in captivity. She's been there for 47 years in, um, in uh, Florida. This whale at the bottom, uh, uh, L-25, is thought to be her closest living relative. They still speak the same language, which is really sad when you think about an animal being in captivity for going on 50 years, and she still has family in the in the wild that speak her language. Um, more on that if you're interested in that uh, that information. Orca Network uh, is a great place to go to find information on Lolita. So uh, as Mike Big and Ken Balcom were piecing these things together, they started recognizing that. The southern resident fish-eating killer whales have a very unique natural history in that both males and females stay with their mother their entire life. For some of you, um, by the way, I meant to mention this at the beginning. This is a uh, my talk is a very um, to begin with is uh, just the super basics for all of the folks uh, around the world that are tuned in that might not know uh, too much specifically about the southern residents. And I we decided when we were setting up my talk to have my talk be kind of the, um, the um, get a lot of the basics out of the way so that when Sam Wasser um, speaks next and then uh, uh, Darren Croft, professor from Exeter, speaks uh, later in the day, um, some of these basics are covered and um, they can get on with the science that they have to, to talk to you about. So sorry for some of you, I know you know this and uh, can e easily speak um, as, um, as well or better than I can on the, these basic um, factoids. Anyhow, um, males and females stay with their mother their entire life for the fish eating ecotype. Um, the transient, there are mammal eating killer whales, which now in our community we're trying to get kind of renamed uh, Biggs killer whales as a, a um, to honor Mike's early work with these with these, this type of work. Um, the transients or mammal eaters. Uh, Sometimes females leave the natal group or the, the group in which she was born into, um, and sometimes the males do. And sometimes you'll see adult males with mom uh, or adult females in her calves with mom as well, much like the southern residents. But um, typically, they don't stay together in the same way that the southern residents do, which is to say that um, males and females, except in very rare cases, like we've got an oddball uh, animal named L87, 
um, who has been uh, orphaned a couple of times. He was orphaned young, his mom died, and he's kind of jumped around to older females within the Southern Resident clan. Um, so early studies showed that these whales were incredibly unique, um, incredibly socially bonded animals. Early, uh, some of the early studies um, and documentation of the animals did document some of the females having calves that died right after birth and the females carrying their calves around on their heads, um, which is heartbreaking to see. Uh, but it also really, really is a clear, a clear indication of this entire, you know, incredibly socially bonded um, animal. Uh, generally, animals, males and females, both leave the leave mom, leave home. Um, and so, when you have a really tight group of animals that stays together for uh, the entire life of the matriarchs, it tells you something about uh, about their evolution. It tells you something about, um, so certainly about their social bonding and how um, how important each individual within that family is. And Darren uh, Darren Croft is going to talk uh, more about that later on uh, in the day. So these are just some fun old photos of the early days at the center. Uh, this is a, this boat. This little round thing says Center for Well Research, and this shows you. Um, you know, it's interesting to think and to see these whales. These are massive animals, um, and they have the entire ocean to be in, and yet quite frequently they choose to be grouped up like this. Um, these whales are in contact with one another, and this is just a really beautiful picture of, of, a, of a number of whales, um, probably several families here that are grouped together. And uh, it's, I believe, one of the reasons why humans become so attached to these whales because we start to know them as individuals and we start to know them as families. And uh, when we lose one, it's, 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 hard, it's hard for us and it's hard for us to know how much harder it must be for those whales to lose individuals. And that much more heartbreaking when we know that individuals are being lost or dying because uh, they don't have enough food um, or their water is toxic. And those are things that we humans have caused. And so, um, so we need to get to work to try and, try and um, turn back the clock a bit on, on uh, some of the uh, damage that we've done to the ecosystem so that these whales can survive into the future. Again, more on that a little bit later. Um, but in the meantime, just a couple more photos. Uh, this is a superpod in 1978. And a superpod um, is when all members of the Southern Resident Clan are together. So the, in the Southern Resident community, there is one clan. And then within that clan, there are three pods, J-pod, K-pod, and L-pod. And um, the, the classic definition of a superpod is when all members of the clan, all members of the Southern Resident community um, are together and socializing. And this is just a, a lovely picture of a huge male, a couple of huge males, and then some babies and females in there. And you can just tell, again, these animals are massive animals, and they're just grouped together as tightly as possible socializing with one another. That must have been a remarkable thing. To, it's still remarkable today, even after you've seen it for a couple of, uh, you know, couple of times. Um, uh, but to see it for the first time, it just I just wonder what Ken and, and Mike Big thought of, thought of this, looking at these amazing animals. Um, a picture of J3. This is a male that's not with us any longer, but you can see how urban these animals. This is a cityscape in the background of Seattle, um, back in the mid uh, uh, mid 70s. And boy, it's the the um, skyline has changed in Seattle. But even back then, it was obviously an incredibly urban area, and these whales were uh, accustomed to being there. Um, we call them urban whales. They they are accustomed to being in in uh, proximity to humans, and um, and uh, this this male is uh, I, I actually never got to got to see J3 myself. Um, he had died before I started uh, studying them in 19, uh, 19, 2005. But um, I have a question here about how big orcas can grow. Um, they are they can be uh, it's it's it varies actually. Things are changing with the southern residents. Um, I think. Uh, 30 feet long, uh, males can can be 30 feet long or slightly longer. Females are smaller than that, um, but still still quite massive. 
Um, we have a lot of uh, the kind of physical uh, characteristics, weights and lengths and such like that on our website, centerforwellresearch.com. Um, also, uh, interestingly, there's some new, uh, it's not published yet, but some morphometrics information that's coming out from a study being done by a collaborative group, uh, NOAA, Southwest Fishery Science Center, um, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in La Jolla. Um, doctors John Durbin and Holly Fernbaugh um, are collaborating with the Vancouver Aquarium and their scientist Lance Barrett Leonard, and they're doing some drone work looking at morphometrics, which means um, measuring the whale, so length, length and girth. And uh, some fascinating information is coming out about that. And I think that's going to be really neat to be able to do some comparisons between the transients and the, and the fish eaters, so the mammal eaters and the fish eaters. And I think we'll get some, uh, some, some uh, really great actual um, information and facts about how different and how big the, the one is compared to the other, so the mammal eaters being bigger. Um, you can see these nice, beautiful, straight dorsal fins on these males. Um, having collapsed dorsal fins doesn't occur often in the wild. Uh, it's generally, when you do see it, it's um, a, as a result of um, nutritional deficiencies or possibly from trauma, such as being um, hit by a vessel. Uh, you Sometimes you see fin collapse, um, very different than, the, than um, the captive situation where the animals just don't have enough room to to exercise and to keep both sides of their bodies equally toned and, and fit. And that can um, sometimes cause some, uh, all, all, actually almost always it causes fin, fin droop in, in males and actually in females in captivity. Um, so uh, just some interesting fun behaviors from the Southern residents. Kelping is something that whales do, other whales do in other populations from around the world. We see it quite a lot with the fish eating killer whales. Um, this picture at the top left is a, a photograph of a couple of twins. Uh, our friends have had twins. These, these girls are um, late teens now, but this is when they were about eight. And you can see them standing on the rock there at Lime Kiln State Park, um, also known as Whale Watch Park, and how close the whales come to that part of the island, which is just a fantastic um, area to go to look at the whales. And that whale spent about um, 20 minutes just rolling around in that kelp bed um, in front of the, the girls. It was pretty, pretty remarkable. And another picture up there on the top with that, um, that whale with the kelp draped across the dorsal fin. And then the bottom two pictures show um, a really interesting um, uh, phenomenon that the whales, that the southern residents do. And it's a greeting ceremony where the whales line up um, when they haven't seen each other for a while. The, um, the different groups of whales will, will line up facing one another. And uh, we don't really know what the cue is that tells them to um, start socializing or start mingling, but something happens and they just start um, rolling around on each other and they create this amazing whale ball of activity where whales are breaching and, and um, spy hopping and vocalizing above water and generally just greeting each other. Uh, it happens after the different groups of whales haven't seen each other for a while. And so again, just another really interesting cultural thing about these animals that starts to get at how, it, how important they are to each other um, and how important they are for, uh, for, for the world, really, for us to have these incredibly um, unique uh, animals uh, on the planet with us. And it's, it's why I'm so passionate about uh, trying to save them, because they have value just, just because they are, because they've, they've, they've evolved over um, hundreds of thousands of years to be this incredible uh, group of animals, this incredible community of animals. And so uh, we really do uh, have the responsibility of trying to do what we can to save this culture and save, save this population. That's my little shameless pitch for everybody to get involved. Um, so here's a question. Um, how can these massive apex predators only eat salmon? You know, these are massive whales. They're um, tons. They weigh tons. Um, they have to eat several hundred pounds of uh, of fish every day. How, how is it that these massive apex predators could have evolved just to eat salmon? Um, you know, it makes sense that their that their cohort or you know their their um, the 
the mammal eaters that, that share the water with them, having um, a massive stellar sea lion uh, as your dinner uh, makes sense that you would have this massive killer whale. But when you think about salmon, you know, salmon these days, we're shocked when we see a 30 pound Chinook salmon. Um, the answer to this is that salmon used to be massive themselves. So this is a picture, if you Google, um, uh, you know, Chinook salmon, what, um, Astoria, for example, which is at the mouth of the, it's at the mouth of the um, uh, Columbia River, right where it enters the Pacific Ocean. So right where the, well, uh, right, right where the fish would be coming back in to make their migration um, up to their natal spawning grounds. These, these are, um, these fish, I don't know if you can read that, but, um, but the one, uh, one of those fish is 116 pounds and the other one is 121 pounds. I bet a lot of you um, out there, a lot of you um, folks in high school and even, you know, a lot of adults don't even weigh that much. Um, these are massive fish, and that's what the whales evolved to eat. That's what the whales are out there looking to find. And so for a whale to find one of these, they could have gotten away with eating one of these a day, and, um, or two of these a day, certainly. Um, now think about how many they have to eat if the biggest fish they can find is 30 pounds or 20 pounds um, or even in the teens. It means that the whales have to work that much harder um, and search that much longer to find that many fewer fish and that many lower quality fish. And so um, this is why uh, we are so, uh, you know, it is so important for us to get a handle on what's happening with our fish, our fisheries. We have to figure out a way to um, preserve the wild salmon. Um, and the way that we do that is through fisheries management and through habitat restoration and through dam removal for dams that are blocking spawning of these massive fish back to their natal uh, spawning grounds. Um, and these are all things that the center is working on and so many other groups uh, around the Pacific Northwest are getting involved um, and really pushing for some changes in fisheries management and, uh, and habitat restoration, including dam removal. Um, so I have a question here. If one whale is in danger, how do they communicate to help each other? Um, these whales can communicate over massive, massive distances, miles and miles and miles they can communicate. Um, and they presumably have different calls for different types of communication with each other. There are acousticians um, that are looking at these, that, those kinds of questions specifically. Um, one of the things that we have to be aware of is, is that the more noise we put into the environment, the harder it is for the whales to communicate with one another. And so, uh, for example, what we're facing right now is um, the approval by the Canadian government to approve the, um, the expansion of the Kinder Morgan pipeline, which would increase the number of uh, ships, massive ships carrying crude oil uh, um, from, uh, ultimately, it starts at the um, Canadian tar sands in Alberta across the land to the west coast of Canada, uh, and then that product gets loaded onto large ships, and then it ships out through the um, critical habitat of the southern residents and um, to, uh, to, to Asia for refinement and use. Um, we're talking about as many as 34 additional uh, ships that are full of, of uh, crude oil. Um, right through the southern residents critical habitat um, so right through the area where the transients are eating and right through the area where the southern residents are trying to forage um, between may and october and uh, one one spill would be catastrophic for this area um, there is fairly decent tidal flush in the in the salish sea in puget sound salish sea but um, the damage that would be done from, e from even one small leak from one of these uh, shipping vessels could potentially uh, wipe out the southern residents and wipe out really, uh, we, we think, the entire ecosystem. So good question there. Communication is key for these whales. They, they, they have evolved to, um, to be able to communicate over long distances. And, uh, and everything about them, everything about their physical structure goes into making them um, um, very efficient, efficient communicators. 
uh, we're learning more and more about their uh, their um, uh, communication with one another um, uh, every year. So in 19, uh, pardon me, in 2005, they were listed on the Endangered Species Act in the U.S. The Canadians listed them um, in 2003 on their equivalent of the Endangered Species Act called the Canadian uh, Species at Risk Act. Um, as I said, our federal government has designated critical habitat in the U.S. Um, the Canadian, as I, Canadian government, as I understand it, is in the process of um, getting ready to, recommendations have been made by killer whale scientists as to where that critical habitat should be in Canada, but that has not been approved yet. Um, hopefully that'll be soon. Um, through a series of, um, of uh, um, well, years, uh, the and science being called for and science being delivered to the to our federal government um, the three main identified threats are prey decline so quality um, so smaller fish as I was saying smaller fish means less um, fat content um, so the the um, the wells are getting less bang for their buck if you will so they're uh, again they're having to forage longer and more often to find smaller less quality fish so that we believe is the biggest uh, biggest threat to the whales, and then the other threats kind of work in in unison or in synergy with those, and those include um, pollution um, and oil spills, as I as I talked about before. The pollution includes toxins, um, and I do believe Sam Wasser will talk about this more later on in the study. Um, uh, one of his grad students has looked at uh, uh, toxins in the fecal uh, matter, so the poop of the whales. And, um, and so I think he'll give some more information about that, but in a nutshell, the, the main ones that were, uh, have been looked at and are clearly impacting the whales are uh, PCBs, which were an industrial lubricant. Um, DDT was used in agriculture, um, and uh, it's a, a pesticide that um, uh, kills pests in agriculture, and then um, PVDEs, which are flame retardants, and all of these chemicals, and many, many, many more, but uh, these three main classes of, of uh, toxins are fat-loving toxins. They're called lipophilic toxins, so they, they, they bind fat and lock themselves up in the fat, so as long as a whale is eating enough, that fat stays stored in their, in their blubber, but as soon as they're not getting enough to eat, they're starting to metabolize their fat, st fat stores, and then that circulates the toxins within within their system, and it makes them, uh, uh, you know, it can cause immune suppression problems, and it makes them more lethargic. We know from human studies when uh, when toxins are circulating in our system, it makes us feel lethargic, slightly out of it. Um, so certainly, it would impact the whale's ability to forage and find food. So it's kind of a downward word spiral. The less food they get, the more they metabolize their blubber, the more uh, toxins circulate, and the less they feel like foraging. Um, and then vessel effects. As I hinted at, um, vessels um, uh, have uh, just the, the, the noise that they put off, and then the potential for things like oil spills, um, or even just a boat uh, grounding out on a, on a reef or, uh, or hitting land. Um, the potential for that is just, it's, it's really mind-boggling, the, the, um, the potential damage that could be done to the whales and to, um, to, uh, to the ecosystem. And then there's, uh, you know, the, um, well, gosh, you know, that's a whole other lecture. So um, there are regulations in place to keep vessels, um, private and commercial vessels, at a distance that um, was determined by the federal government to be a safe distance, so 200 yards from the whales. Um, and vessels, although there's not a speed limit right now, vessels are um, uh, uh, respectful of, uh, of the whales and try to stay below a certain um, knots per hour, which lessens the, um, the, the, the noise in, in the region of the whales. Um, so, So getting to the statistics of the whales, so when Ken Balcom first put out uh, the census in 1976, there were only 71 animals after the, uh, the removals for the captive industry. Um, the population increased 
um, for a, a couple of years uh, after, so essentially the captive industry just uh, determined that uh, there was a, a specific age of whales that was a good, good age to take out of the wild. So the younger whales that were weaned but were still small enough to transport and uh, the younger they were, the more socially bonded they became with their human um, people. Um, the people from, you know, their trainers and whatnot. And so there was a, a whole cohort or a whole generation of animals that were removed from the southern resident population. And so we end up seeing this decline. I don't know if you can see this, um, this is my arrow. Um, there was a decline when, the, when those, those whales weren't in the wild um, having calves of their own. And then um, up through 1995, the population increased fairly, um, fairly well, fairly steadily. And then after 1995, there was a whole nother um, decline that couldn't be directly um, pinned on the captive industry, although there were probably certainly residual effects of that. Um, and then uh, essentially that's when the federal governments on both sides of the borders decided that something had to be done uh, to, to try and um, you know, figure out what was causing the declines. And that's when those threats that I was just talking about, that's when those threats and more uh, there are other threats to the population, like inbreeding and, and things like that. The, that's when those threats were identified. And again, we see um, in 1995, there were 88 animals in the population. That was the official census on July 1st, um, when the whales were listed in the U.S., 88 animals. And then essentially, they, they have, they have, the population has increased a little bit, but, but we're on a downward trajectory. Actually, we're going the wrong way. There are only at the end of 2016, so December 2016, there are just 78 animals in the southern resident clan. Um, so clearly going the wrong way with, the, with recovery. And as I said before, um, we believe that the, the biggest threat, the most important threat to address right now is the lack of prey. Um, we know that prey is the biggest problem because when you look at the mammal eaters, the mammal eaters have a lot of different things to choose from. They eat porpoises, harbor porpoise and doll's porpoise. They eat um, seals and sea lions. They have a wide variety of things to choose from. And the population of those species are fairly high in the, in the, in the area where, we're, where we study. And we see that playing out in a positive way by the fact that the, um, the, those, those animals, the mammal eaters, are increasing, the population is increasing. Females are having calves at regular intervals every three to five years, and those calves are being born and living. Um, what we see with the Southern Resident Clan uh, here, um, J-Pod had some, some pretty good growth in the last couple of years, um, but we've also had some really significant declines in J-Pod. We only have 24 animals, um, whereas at the beginning of the year last year, we had 29 animals. Um, you can see the bottom, the J-pod is the blue, the blue um, line there. You can see from K-pod, the bottom red line, they haven't had a, a calf that, that was born and lived since 2011. Uh, and just, you can imagine how that can be a problem. We really need to be seeing these animals having calves every three to five years and having population, the, the population increasing in all three pods, not just J-pod. And then the most significant declines you can see there are uh, in green, and that's with LPOD. Um, so uh, overall, again, the population is going in the wrong direction. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster so that we can get to a, um, a study that I'm looking at right now. It's a collaborative project. Um, but lastly on this, uh, the coastwide abundance of Chinook salmon and Chinook salmon, um, as a lot of people know, are the preferential prey of the southern resident group. They're the biggest fish, they're the fattiest fish, so the whales are, the, if they can find one Chinook, it's like finding several other types of, like say, coho. Um, so the whales are really fine-tuned and, and seek out those, those Chinook salmon. Unfortunately, Chinook are, are endangered themselves throughout this entire southern resident uh, range from Monterey to Southeast Alaska. And this chart is a really nice one. All of these, uh, these lines at the bottom, these different colors of, of, um, of lines, these each represent a different river um, from the middle of Oregon to, to Alaska. And when you combine them all, that overall shape, um, you can see that there's peaks and valleys in that. 
and um, the bars at the top, the purple bars at the top, those show southern resident killer whale deaths. And so really, if I had to pick one graph, one chart to talk to people about that, that, that shows um, the problem and, and, and the situation that the whales are facing, it would be this graph right here. And what that's showing is that when the fish is high, with, when fish abundance is high, you get these nice big peaks at the bottom. Let me see if I can just point here. So uh, this is uh, high at the bottom. Let me see if I can just point here. So uh, this is uh, high and high and high, and then you get these low valleys where the fish abundance, overall coastwide abundance of Chinook salmon um, is low, and that's when you see these, uh, these high numbers of southern resident killer whale deaths. And this doesn't even paint the picture of all of the calves that are born um, that die um, quickly and don't get named, so they're not considered part of the census, and it also doesn't count the females that get pregnant but lose their calves um, before the calves are, are old enough to be born and live. And so miscarriages, and uh, Sam Wasser is going to talk about that more. Um, more than 50%, I think it's more like 60 plus percent of all pregnancies are lost to miscarriages, which is, is again, Sam will talk more about that. Um, so this is one more thing to think about when we're thinking about fish and the fish that these whales need to eat. So this chart here, all of these lines, all of these colors also represent different rivers um, that fish are coming from. Um, but really what this graph is showing is um, where the fish are from that get caught in Alaska that are allowed to be called Alaskan caught wild salmon. Um, that is something that we hear if you eat fish uh, you're told oh it's okay to eat wild caught alaskan salmon because alaska has a sustainable fishery but this chart shows us that it's only this purple bar this purple band at the bottom that represents fish that were born in alaska and would die in alaska basically go back to alaskan rivers to spawn and die only that purple bar at the bottom is alaskan salmon. The rest of these, all of this other salmon that gets caught in Alaska is not bound for Alaskan rivers. All these other fish were bound for rivers below, so in BC, Canada, and even into the United States. And so this is a problem with fisheries fisheries in the naming of, of fish, and, and this is really something that we need to get a handle on, uh, because you can't say that Alaskan fisheries are sustainable um, unless you're sp sp speaking very specifically about specific rivers and specific runs, because 90 plus percent of the fish that are caught in Alaska are not Alaskan fish. I hope that makes sense, because that's a very important point, and it very much speaks to the problem that these southern resident killer whales are facing in that they don't have enough food. So, um, on to uh, the, the, some of the other work that the center is doing. Um, a colleague, Jane Kogan, is taking information gleaned from a number of different sources, the center, uh, the Pacific Well Watchers Association, and a number of other uh, um, um, contributors, trying to get a handle on what's happening in the Salish Sea and looking at this kind of what we're calling a shifting baseline of uh, use by marine mammals in the Salish Sea. And this is a great picture from 2015. She's, uh, Jane is in the process of um, getting the 2016 data up and going, but just to show you what she's putting together, um, this is a fabulous little graph showing that there are a number of different species that are using uh, the, the inland waters, uh, uh, the Salish Sea. So we had fin whales last year. We had a number of humpback whales. When I first started studying the southern residents, in 2005, there were it was it was a surprise to see a humpback or two. Um, now we people were seeing groups of 50 plus humpbacks coming into the area, and foraging, which is pretty phenomenal to see. Um, so a lot of different animals are utilizing the inland waters of the Salish Sea. Unfortunately, the southern residents are using it less and less because the food that they used to come there to find is becoming more and more scarce and there's just not enough fish to pull all of the southern residents into the inland waters at the same time in superpods. That's why we really need to um, 
we really need to be getting a handle on getting fish back in there. Fish that are bound for the Fraser River up here in Canada. That's the fish that the whales would have been coming into the inland waters looking for between May and October. That's why they became known as residents, because they were following those fish that were bound for the Fraser River. Um, and other rivers like the Skagit River um, down farther, uh, down, down in um, the Washington, uh, 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 that's a Washington River. So, um, so much work to be done, but uh, I am still hopeful that, uh, that we can make some policy changes to get more fish in the water for the whales to find. Um, this is a pretty fabulous graph uh, that Jane put together of all months of the year for 2015 and then stacked together by species. So we see that the southern residents still are the predominant uh, animal or, or ecotype of whale, uh, killer whale seen in the inland waters. Um, so seen on 300 days, uh, uh, which is a lot actually, um, when you think about how many days there are in a year and that uh, these wells were seen um, during large portions of, uh, of that time. The transient killer wells are increasing in, in number and how often we see them in the inland waters. And you can see that they're, they're crutching up here on, the, on the, um, the, the fish eaters and then humpbacks. 2015. Um, I wish we had this graph to compare to 2005 because you'd probably see way down here, you know, like less than 10 humpbacks. And um, uh, Kelly asks, why so many humpbacks? Um, it's presumably prey driven, um, as it is for the southern residents. The fact that we're not seeing the southern residents in the inland waters during the time that we normally would have. Um, uh, same idea, so prey driven, and then uh, also back when the whales were being hunted, um, the, whale, the humpback whales were extirpated, that's a word that's used to describe an animal that is not extinct, meaning dead, dead in the wild. Extirpated means that they're driven from an area, and uh, humpbacks were probably extirpated from the Salish Sea um, during, the, during the whaling age, and it's taken a long time for them to um, I guess maybe find would be a good way to think about it, find their way back there. Clearly the opening to the Salish Sea through the Strait of Juan de Fuca between Vancouver Island and um, the Olympic Peninsula and Washington hasn't closed, you know, was never closed per se, but um, just, just fewer were making the foray in there. And maybe that's some sort of cultural knowledge that got passed down to the humpbacks, we don't know. But, uh, but certainly that, those, those animals are increasing in abundance in the, in the inland waters. Um, same with minke whales over time. Uh, minke whales used to be very, very abundant there. Um, we know that work from John Stern and colleagues uh, with the minke project. Um, they've been documenting the, the rise again in minke whales in the area. Gray whales, same thing. Um, and then this fabulous um, sighting of fin whales. Um, and then very occasionally we'll see northern resident killer whales, which are also uh, fish eaters, but their territory is uh, north of Campbell River in Canada. So they just they generally don't come down uh, into the uh, Salish Sea where we are uh, the lower the lower um, Canadian lower Canadian Gulf Islands and San Juan Islands. They do come down and then go out the the strait, but they don't generally hang out. It's like the southern residents' territory, if you will. Um, and then this is uh, a graph showing the difference in how things have changed over time. Uh, in the 1970s, this is uh, um, the number of occurrences in the Strait of Georgia um, of residents. So residents are in blue and transients uh, are uh, in red. So fish eaters versus mammal eaters. And in the 70s, it's clear that the resident fish eaters were the ones that were seen the most often. Whereas in the 2000s, it's, that has shifted exactly the opposite. So it's the mammal eaters that, that are being seen more in the Strait of Georgia. And um, it'll be interesting to see how, we, how things pan out in the next couple of years. I will tell you that um, last year, we were seeing transient killer whales much more frequently than we were seeing the fish eating killer whales in the early part of the year. Um, so again, Jane Kogan, our colleague at the center is, is pulling that information together for 2016. Um, I can't believe almost an hour has gone by. Um, another question, why is the northern resident population doing so much better than the southern residents? Um, they have, uh, 
the easiest way to say it is that they have first crack at the fish that are returning from, from Alaska um, bound for their natal rivers in BC and, and BC Canada and the US. The northern residents have first access to them. They come into contact with them faster because they're farther north. That's what we believe is happening. Certainly the southern residents could swim that far, but again, we, it comes down to culture and range. How, what, the, what the northern resident range traditionally has been versus the southern resident killer whale range. And the southern resident range has been, um, at least for part of the clan, LPOD and KPOD, their range is south into, into northern California, down to Monterey. Um, whereas the northern residents, their range has been going north up into the Canadian, you know, farther up into the Queen Charlottes and um, uh, those islands off the coast of BC, Canada, and then up into Alaska. Um, and then also as the fish are coming back down, the northern resident whales have uh, first, first access to them. So we think that's what's going on there. Uh, in the last 10 minutes, I wanna tell you about a study, a collaborative project that I'm working on. Uh, we should have a draft out soon um, where uh, the fish eating killer whales have been documented since they've been studied in the early 70s, they have been documented, but it's increasing in, in frequency where the fish eating killer whales are killing harbor porpoise and they used to kill dolls porpoise, although that doesn't happen very frequently, but killing usually young porpoises. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenon I'm calling uh, focinicide. Uh, the Latin name for harbor porpoise is focina focina. So it's a little play on, the, on that. Um, and the big, the big, you know, interesting question here um, is that these fish-eating killer whales don't eat the porpoises. They don't even bite them. They just kind of play with them to death. Um, and we're trying to figure out why. And so I have a couple of slides here. I gave a portion of this talk at the Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference last year, and uh, we're getting ready to do some higher level statistics on the data. So my slides here are slightly out of date because they don't include the many, many, many accounts that I have from 2016, but this will show you the trend. So this is what the database looks like. Um, uh, again, data coming from the Whale Museum, Orca Network, and the people that contribute to that sightings database, the CDOC Society um, a program of the University of California, Davis, Cascadia Research, located in Olympia, their scientists have been studying um, cetaceans, some whales and dolphins in the Salish Sea for years and years. They've, they've given us some information. NOAA, uh, so National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and then the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So John Ford and uh, colleagues have contributed to this data set as well. So um, here's a picture of L5. L50, uh, L58 and L73, um, none of those whales are alive anymore, but this shows an early, one of the early uh, documentations of, of this. This is actually a, a, a doll's porpoise neonate. Again, they tend, these whales tend to play with or pick on the young porpoises. So that's a question to keep in your mind, because I'm going to ask you at the end why you think this is happening. Um, so there, here's a picture of that. Whoops. Um, here's another one from 1992. Uh, this is a different incident. Um, again, uh, L73 as a young animal, often the animals, the killer whales are young that are involved in this, in this behavior. So this is actually, I, it's sad, but it's kind of a cute picture where I, I don't know if you can see, but here's the young, uh, porpoise. And then here's a very young L73. L73, as I said, has passed away. He was a fabulous young bull male when he died. Um, here's another little picture of this. Uh, this, um, this is a harbor porpoise neonate. Here's a very young killer whale here. And here's some statistics on it. So we can see in the top right, uh, top left hand uh, box the porpoise age class. So unfortunately, um, they, uh, early on, the, the age of the animal wasn't documented. When people were seeing this behavior, they weren't 
they weren't documenting uh, the age. Now we, you know, scientists and the Well Watch community and people, um, uh, uh, we've put out a call, the Center for Well Research has put out a call for information to be sent in. And so um, hopefully this will, uh, that all new accounts will have an age associated with it. So uh, clearly some of these could have been neonates as well, but we see um, uh, 13 neonates have been documented, two juveniles, and no adults, which is interesting. Um, and then uh, this is the species unspecified again, where it wasn't documented who was killed. It was just documented that a porpoise was being harassed to death um, or killed. Um, harbor porpoise make up the, the majority of these, uh, these incidences and then dolls, uh, dolls porpoise. Dolls porpoise were documented before in the past being more, more frequently taken, but since 2004, uh, never or very, very infrequently. Um, and then these are confirmed kills, 11 confirmed kills out of our 41 incidents. Um, we have documented more than 60 now. I just, again, this, this part of my slideshow was put together for a previous talk, and uh, I'm still in the process of pulling all of the 2016 information together. Um, and then obviously some of these harassments might have been might have been kills as well, but uh, the, maybe the person left before the whales were done playing with the animal. Um, so this is the age bin of the whales that were identified. So um, quite a number of the animals that were involved were young animals. Um, a, a one incident with a bit quite old animal. So again, this, this I think plays into what's going on here. Um, so be thinking about why you think this is happening. Oh, we've just got four minutes to talk about it. Uh, I'll just quickly say that members of all pods, all J, K, and L pods have been uh, documented uh, engaging in this behavior. And uh, so I, I'll just throw it out there. Why, why do some of you think this might be happening? Uh, because we're out of time, uh, I'll, I'll say what, what my hypothesis was. I thought that maybe it was because of competition, that maybe the whales were trying to kill things that were eating the same things that they were. But actually, you can see here from this slide that um, this is what the, the um, this is what killer whales eat, mammal eating killer whales eat. This is what fish eating killer whales eat. So these are fairly large salmon. Uh, and then this is what porpoise eat. Uh, oops, sorry. This is this is the size of porpoises. So if you think back to the to the size of the whales, uh, or excuse me, size of the fish that the whales originally started eating when they were evolving to be fish eaters only, those those fish would have been very very large. Well, these these baby porpoises are fairly large. They're 18 pounds to 55 pounds. And this is what they eat. They don't eat the same thing at all that the whales eat. So they're not, I don't believe they're not uh, trying to get rid of competition. Um, here's just another picture. And really what I think is happening, and, and this, the, we're, we're going to get to the bottom of this, um, I think what is happening is that this is a, a, a way for the whales to um, practice finding fish and catching fish. So it's probably a teaching mechanism uh, for, the, for the young whales to engage in. Um, but it also just might be fun. It might be just that the whales are playing with these porpoises because they essentially run away. So kind of like maybe a cat and mouse sort of thing. We don't know yet, but this is something that we'll be looking at and the paper should be coming out uh, fairly soon, uh, um, certainly within the next year. So stay tuned for that. Um, my card's down there at the bottom, uh, whaleresearch.com. And uh, please uh, email me if you have any questions. Uh, check out our website. We have a lot of uh, great information. And you can follow us uh, with our encounters with the whales. Um, in our, there's a drop-down menu for, it, for called encounters. And you can track us uh, and see who we're, ha who we're seeing out there in the water uh, uh, at any time. So we've got less than a minute if there's any last minute questions. Um, so one last question somebody's asking, uh, why are they named an alphanumeric, so a letter and, an, and a number? Um, that had to do with when the study first started. That's how they kept track of them. 
is uh, they recognize that an animal was in J-pod and it might be the 12th animal, so that animal became known as J12. Thank you guys so much for having me. I hope that uh, set the stage for the next two killer whale talks that are coming. Um, question here, do mammal eating uh, whales eat sharks? We don't think so. Not according to their teeth. Looks like they're just mostly eating other mammals. Thank you guys so much. That was great fun. Hope you learned something.